Hello, welcome to the uh, panel on questioning the pur purposefulness of goals. Um, sorry, I didn't design the, uh, the the name of the panel. My name is Benjamin J. Butler, uh, and I, I'm joined by uh, half my panel, esteemed panel. Um, but um, we, we've got some uh, two great visionaries with, with me so far. David Goldsmith, um, who is president of Goldsmith Organization, but um, also Project Moon Hut, a, um, I guess, a think tank for the future. Um, uh, and uh, envisioning, um, I, I, I believe, through the means of um, imagining building a civilization in space um, and making that relevant to many of the, the problems and crises we are facing um, today on planet Earth. Uh, and uh, Michael Drexler, uh, Chief Strategy Officer uh, at Bright Star Capital, uh, who is based in sunny Florida and oscillates between New York and Florida, and um, uh, who um, uh, and Bright Star is um, a, a private equity fund. So um, I'm sure, I hope the other panelists will be able to hop in. Um, we um, potentially have the managing director for Kroll in Canada, who told me some fascinating things um, the other day on a, a pre-call and Fred Burke, uh, senior advisor at Baker and McKinsey in Vietnam. So um, I, I wanted to kick off um, the first round in, in talking about how have you seen over the last decade uh, a, the, the, the shift in role of and, and importance of purpose uh, and goals for, for organizations. Um, my my um, second question, I was going to then delve into the problems with some of these goals like SDGs and ESGs and how we and how uh, potentially we police them. But um, first, I just wanted to reflect on where we've uh, where we've come from. My uh, I'm, I'm now a futurist, but my career started uh, on Wall Street uh, and um, I was dispatched to Tokyo many years ago uh, because I speak Japanese amongst uh, other things. And I remember when we would, you know, th th these were in the days where we were all completely blinded, I believe, by Milton Friedman's shareholder primacy. And um, um, one of my roles was representing um, the interests of Western shareholders. And we'd often go into um, uh, meet senior leaders of Japanese companies and be absolutely horrified that they had goals other than shareholders interests um, um, and the the uh, I, I'll never forget the, the the look of outrage when some of these companies would have very flowery missions and I, I think in cases were quite concerned about other stakeholders apart from uh, shareholders um, and now the whole world seems to be shifting. So I guess my, my, my question for, um, for you is how, how have you seen the, the shift in the last uh, decade or two? Um, maybe I'll start with David. Thank you. I, having listened to the whole day, I will kind of bring it full circle or started last night to set up about four hours. I have seen over the past 10 years in my work if we're using that decade experience, I've seen the conversation shift, but I don't see the outcome shift, meaning it is trendy to be sustainable. Uh, there are a lot of words that are being used, such as we need to communicate better. We need to work together. We need to collaborate better. We need to get government intervention. We need to get the United Nations involved in this. And when push comes to shove, the average activity that we do every day is often just as harmful as everything else that's happening in the organization. So the conversation has shifted, yet, I don't know, I we still use toilet paper. And 27,000 trees are cut down every single day for toilet paper. And for paper towels, it's 57,000 trees per day are cut down for toilet paper. We take selfies and post 
even more than we did before. And the inventor of Siri did some math one day. He said, for every post you put on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever, it consumes enough energy to be able to keep three 20 watt light bulbs running for an hour. And that's including storage. So yeah, I heard the conversations, yet the lights are still on and the activities we engage in don't meet that long-term expectation and we're seeing it. We have not stopped the snowball. Yes, we are, we're melting it. Uh, maybe the bulldozer would be a better analogy. So that's my take. Okay, great. Um, uh, well, I'm not sure it's great, but um, <laughs> I, I always, I always enjoy your forthright um, opinions, and, and um, I, I do believe that's what we need at the moment. Um, our honesty and self self reflection um, as a species. Um, what What are your thoughts, Michael? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a bit more upbeat on it and say, uh, and, and we, as a firm, we we work a lot and invest a lot into family owned businesses who always had a sense of locality and and the S in ESG and so legacy and uh, stakeholders mean a lot to them and have meant a lot to them and that's probably not changed that much but what we have seen change is the narrative from and vis-a-vis -vis investors and so the firms that give us their capital to invest they want to know a lot more about ESG and and the footprint and the impact of our investments and it does make some sense to some degree. 10 years ago, that was sort of a nice to have, and it was a, you know, tick a few boxes outside of your main mission of returns. Of course, what's happening now is the returns and the impact or the avoidance of, of certain environmental damage can go together. So I switch out my factory lighting for, for LEDs. It means I put out less CO2 because I consume less energy, but also pay less money because I consume less energies. And so the ecological and the economical are more aligned. And I think as we've seen more progress in energy, as we've seen more progress in mobility and in, in many other technologies, that innovation has allowed the purpose and the returns to come together more. And then through the pandemic, of course, we've also learned to look a little bit more at purpose at, at an individual level. So this uh, I need to do a hundred hour work week in the office uh, just to show my face uh, has given way to a reflection of what, what are what are my priorities as a talented individual and how do these interlock with my company and so but to the topic of diversity if if I hire more women into my workforce not, not only do I improve my ESG scores which needn't be a thing in its own right but I get access to a deeper talent pool and better decision making and better team dynamics. And so I think we have come a long way in the last decade, but I would echo a little bit uh, David's point. Uh, there is still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, given it seems like the other panelists are not um, um, are unlikely to join us because of technical um, hit, hitches, you'd have thought they would be uh, resolved by now, uh, 20, 20 years in from uh, the what I call the be the beginning of the internet. Um, I know it's a lot longer, but... Um, well, that's, what you're describing it as an example of a belief structure that we will solve the challenges we have, and yet the challenges we have become more compounded by the interconnectedness of the things in which we do. So we can have this illusion that a digital economy or a digital world is going to make us better. But both you and I, Ben, Benjamin, have lived in Asia. There's 273 million people who live in Indonesia. 273 million, that's the equivalent, almost, of the United States. And 17,500 islands. And sea level water rise is going to decimate this country, just like it's going to decimate Bangladesh. or the illusion that we're not doing, we're doing enough and we get 50 to 60 degrees C in India for three weeks. That's, that's ecosystem collapse. That is, uh, that's mass extinction. That is, and that's our future. We're not stopping that bulldozer. 
Are you, did we lose him? I can't see Ben. I, I've lost Ben and you're muted on mine, Michael. At least it's not like these Zoom conversations where the whole session collapses. If the whole, uh, <laughs> so he's gone. Hopefully he'll join us very soon. Okay. Again. So let, let me ask you with, uh, with what we just, what you just described, is it a, do you see on a global scale? I mean, anything, be as honest as you can, anything that you see solving tomorrow, the challenges that we're facing on a large scale. Do you see anything that's really making that happen? So I, I wouldn't say tomorrow, but uh, you know, I, I look at the share of in, renewable going up. I, I look at electric vehicles, which to be honest, 15 years ago, you, you would have been mad to get into one of them. And now certainly in the, in the rich parts of the U S there's a very large share of Tesla's on the road. So I'm, I'm optimistic in the power of innovation. Now I'm also pessimistic to say, we can't just say, oh yeah, here's Elon Musk and let's wait until we have nuclear fusion and do nothing in the meantime. We gotta keep pushing the envelope and, and we've gotta listen to the activists in this way and the activists play a very good role. Um, but I, I think we'll get there. I think as a species, I would, I would bet on, on our resilience as a species and on us eventually figuring things out if, if survival depends on it. What, what I say to people often or ask them, and you, I, I'm 58, so I'll give my age out there. I say, add 40 years onto your life. You have a number. You have, do you have children? Relate? Okay. Do you have close relatives that are younger? Sure. Add, add 50, uh, 40 years onto their life. Add 40 years on, so they might even have children. Mm -hmm. Might they have children? Those children have children if you do the math? Potentially. Yeah. So you might have three to four generations of people you know on this planet. What's going to happen in the next 40 years on a global scale when we look at the challenges we're facing? And the challenge is, I don't think that question's asked enough. Yeah, I think, I, th I think that's right. The, the counter to this though is, and I'm with, with Hans Rosling on this one, wind back the clock 40 years and think of what we've achieved today and how we couldn't even think of a lot of the things that, were, that, that we've achieved in, in the last 40 years. And so I think trying to forecast the world and not, now our futurist has joined us, so I quickly shut up again. Well, wait, wait, trying to I'd forecast like to the world right on right today's now. paradigm. I'd like to take that for a moment. In the 40 years, humanity has changed. But if we were to look at planet Earth, have we improved it over the past 40 years? Or have we not? What does the data show? Well, I, I, I mean, just to jump back in. Uh, yeah, you I, can answer the question. <laughs> What's that? You can answer the question. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's obvious that a the planetary health. I mean, I I, I like the um, um, gosh, what are they called? The the, the circle, the boundaries. Um, I forgot the from the Stockholm uh, School of Resilience um, planetary boundaries model. Um, I mean, it, it's it looks terrible, and and climate's not the worst. Biodiversity, no, it's not the worst. What was what was the worst? I think that there's been some um, modified versions I've seen of that floating around, that are more um, co complex. But um, you know, we're in the sixth extinction. Um, I I on a previous panel um, with Chip Commons, the founder of the Renewable Energy Institute. Um, I mentioned, um, I mean, every week we're bombarded by new, but new data, but um, th this week we had the UN World Meteorological Organization, their state of the global climate. Um, sea levels hitting a record high in 2021. 20, Oceans are more acidic, yeah. um, worst in 26,000 years. Yeah. The list goes on. Africa's facing potentially the worst drought in 40 years. And, um, you know, we, we 
started this decade, um, I always thought 20, 2020 would be a major tipping point. Uh, we don't have a tipping point. So, I think what he's so we'll go back to the question or the thought. I I'm it's not an I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm pragmatic. And the challenge that I have in these discussions is we have things such as the 17 SDGs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you can name all 17 of them. But no. they don't make sense. Yeah, you can't have zero poverty or no poverty, zero hunger. Okay, that makes sense. Those are targets. Those are goals. If we were to take things such as life on earth or life on land and life on water, that remember Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other. They don't match. Those yeah. are targets. These are not. And then if we add on top of it, there's this one strong institutions. I would argue China's a strong institution. Should we have more of those? So our, our challenge to the way in which we're answering the question of the solution, the challenges we have is it's not holistic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, by, and by nature, by nature, nature and ESG is multidimensional. Correct. And so you, it's very simple with the financial PNL. It's a linear scale. It's positive or negative. In, in ecology, I, I go to from fossil fuels to biofuels and I'm, doing good on CO2, but I'm doing bad on water and food security. Right. And so there's a trade off. How, how every... do I make the trade offs? Exactly. Correct. We, we have EVs, mm -hmm. yet we've already defined that solar panels and products from EVs are going to be shipped to third world countries. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to deal with how do you get rid of the toxic chemicals that have been created or, or had to be mined in order to create these so-called solutions for tomorrow yeah. and so it's as you just said it's not an even equation and we talk about it as if it is and and we have a moderator back and another panelist yes we have frederick <laughs> we've been <laughs> waiting guess. for you frederick well, i'm well, sorry we've been waiting no. for you actually michael's been uh, he's been saying i can't wait for frederick to come i want to hear him oh. <laughs> Thank you. I really persevered to, I mean, I, thick and thin, I thought it was the Vietnamese uh, internet access or the Sea Games or something. It turned out to be Baker McKenzie's own security system. So there we go. Well, I'm not the moderator, but I'm saying hello. We've got him yeah. back. Well, He's so we mentioned up and going to get a drink and coming back and, and doing things. So Ben Ben is the guy in charge. Uh, <laughs> well, I feel like I've lost the momentum now. I'm at... Uh, Fred, I um I've got kicked off the system twice myself, so I, I wouldn't feel too bad. I think today we're having some technical um, glitches, so I've just lost the last few minutes uh, myself. We, we were we were talking about the the inability or the disconnect between what is being said and done and the realities of what's happening in the on the planet. While we say that we're moving forward in one place or we have these targets, the 17 SDGs. And I, I asked Michael, name name 17, name all 17 of them. <laughs> and we went over the fact that you have no poverty, zero hunger, but that's very different than life on land and life in water. They're one of these, they don't match. They're not, they're not the same. They're not targets or not targets. And then we have strong institutions. Well, yep. there are, we've lost democracy around the world as a whole. So strong institutions are rising. Authoritarianism, and those are institutions. So when you say you want strong institutions with a definition that's not a good definition, and how do you build around a plan that basically has a disjointed disconnectedness in its even creation? It's just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's what we were talking about, Ben. That's uh, we, makes we, sense. Before we kicked you off, actually, Michael kicked you off. He has a button. They <laughs> didn't tell me about that. Well, uh, I mean, the first question, um, Fred, I asked was um, where, where, um, where, where, when you look at the last decade or two, uh, um, where, how do you think things have changed in terms of um, the role of, of purpose uh, and goals like the SDGs? <laughs> Um, just to 
give you a clue, David's been uh, quite pessimistic, thinks that um, a lot of it's been lip service and, and uh, that, that in I'm actuality that I'm pragmatic. It's not pessimistic. I'm pragmatic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, well, certainly there's been a certain amount of green greenwashing, you know, that's going on out there in the marketplace. Um, some of the worst perpetrators or some of the biggest vendors on PR um, help to get them out of that, that reputation. Uh, and today I heard on CNBC calling, you know, the stock market has just dived in the last uh, couple of days for the tech sector, uh, many of whom were considered to be green heroes uh, just a week ago. So they're calling that the chip wreck now. <laughs> Chip wreck is a good one, but uh, but I guess I guess the 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 point is that um, you know there there's no independent validation society or, or standard setting agency for the the sustainable development goals. Um, we have the same problem with ESGs in Vietnam. We're trying to introduce a requirement to um, some somehow disclose in stock exchange registrations uh, what people's ESG status is. Um, but you know, just like in London and New York. Um, it's hard to 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 have a one size fits all policy for those kind of things. So, it's a it's it's a it's a worthy effort, but um you know and then Tesla didn't get on the ESG uh, um, list. I understand. So Elon Musk was ranting about that this morning too. So it's quite interesting. It's, I, I think the the discussion is legitimate though because you know you had Exxon as one of the top co companies there, and you know, the you know electric vehicles getting kicked off the list. Strange because when you dissect an electric vehicle, you still have parts. True. Yeah, and it may not be made in a very environmentally way, it may, right. um, you know, manner, but but it does seem that that's the way they're going. Um, and there's, you know, he's got a tipping point, um, which he might be, may have reached or, or not yet or or soon uh, with the batteries. That's a you know key element of that. So, um, I think it's, uh, I, I think to kick him off the list would have been premature. <laughs> I, I I think um I mean bringing up Tesla is probably a good segue into the, the the second question I was intending to ask the panel about um the usefulness of these uh various goals uh and metrics and the SG and SDGs and um and and often they can be at cross purposes um so um yeah I, I was Somewhat surprised myself that the S and P kicked them off the um, ESG index, uh, especially given it was such a significant holding for for many funds around the world. And um, um, who do we have left on it? I think um, we've got Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and of course a, a, a major oil and gas company, um, Exxon um remains on the on the list um and so um in fact i had a a quote from um tesla the current environmental social and governance reporting does not measure the scope of positive impact on the world instead it focuses on measuring the dollar value of risk return individual investors who entrust their money to ESG funds of large investment institutions are perhaps unaware that their money can be used to buy the shares of companies that make climate change worse, not better. Um, Absolutely. So that's one um, re recent case study with um, the, these things. Um, but um, yeah, what, what what other issues and challenges do you does the panel perceive with the uh, uh, these goals and and how, how do leaders um, yeah balance them? I mean, if I could use an example from um, our um, our evolution in Vietnam and in China before that um, about it goes to the number sixteen, the peace, justice, and strong institutions. And I don't mean autocratic strong institutions; <laughs> I mean good democratic strong institutions. I just but, laid it out to you. <laughs> <laughs> when Viet, when I came to Vietnam in '91, you know, of course, I didn't in the office. There was hardly any lawyers here, and um, we, you know, uh, basically, 
you, you know, motivated people with the idea of there was a strong nationalistic tendency. People wanted to build the country, um, improve their living standards, lift people out of poverty, all these things that are, you know, consistent with the SDGs. So we very consciously sort of appealed to that. And, um, you know, it was, it was a great motivator for the young Vietnamese lawyers coming up that they could build their own capital markets, that they could, you know, build their own environmental law and, you know, other laws which incorporated due process and all these sort of, you know, good, good principles. Um, so that, that worked actually very well. And um, we got 200 people in Vietnam. So the lawyers are first rate, you know, international. The one thing you have to watch out for though, in appealing to people's sense of um, national pride and building their legal system is that sometimes um, they may be competing negatively with another country, which is our big neighbor to the North. And we're, you know, we're sort of just like our Ukraine office and our, our Moscow office, we're trying, you know, they were one office at one point. Now they're, you know, some of the folks in them are our enemies. Um, it's really unfortunate, but we didn't, of course, go that far here in Vietnam. But China is a very sensitive issue here, and therefore, if you you have to be careful not to get that positive motivation of of national sentiment going too far into negative uh, uh, xenophobia. Michael, you wanna go for it? Yeah, over to you, Michael. Yeah, I'd, I'd make three three points on on goals really what one of you you want them to have a connection to reality yeah. and, and that's particularly important when it comes to the speed of change so we we can probably all agree on this panel and and in the audience that uh, switching to renewable energies is is the right thing to do but to say it has to be done in the next three months for every company that you own uh, is, is a tad unrealistic and so the goals have to be realistic, achievable, and, and take care of the reality of, of companies or, or actors. To me, the second bit after reality is trade-offs, which, which David uh, touched on a little earlier. So in that ESG, SDG space, it's not a linear scale. It's, it's multidimensional, and one carbon improvement might uh, be a deterioration in water or food, food security. And so these trade-offs have to be at least acknowledged and if not incorporated into the goals. And the third bit I would say is it touches a little bit on the goals have to fit today's world, but also tomorrow's world and not necessarily yesterday's world. And I'll, I'll take a cheap shot at the Club of Rome, which, which I'm somewhat old enough to remember, who in 1972 said, you know, by the end of 20th century, the world, the planet will run out of resources unless we stop consuming in a very dramatic fashion. Of course, we haven't stopped consuming in a very dramatic fashion. What we've done is we've improved resource efficiency and we've shifted resource usage and we've had innovation. And so I always find it very difficult when goals extrapolate from the world of yesterday in a very rigid fashion to tomorrow. Because tomorrow's world will look different. And so we, we have to keep the goals pragmatic in that sense. Not obviously don't fall, not, not fall asleep, do nothing, but uh, make sure that we don't micromanage the world with goals because they run out of usefulness quite soon often. Mm. Want to respond to that, uh, David? Yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, I'm not going to say goals because I don't like that word as much as desired outcomes we want to achieve. That's a better word. We we don't goals come out of desired outcomes is that the challenge with the goals that we have today is they create a, a, an artificial finish line that we're never crossing. We are not crossing them. We've not been crossing them. And the expectation of solving anything is based upon time loss. It always has a timeline in it. So if we believe that this 50 to 60 degrees C in India, which will go to the Middle East, it's expected 50 degrees C, 40 degrees C, by the middle of the century, uh, that go to Mexico and, to, and it'll go to uh, Indonesia, the, uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and you'll have a mass migration of uh, humans as well as other species. You'll have ecosystem collapses across and not to say that we won't solve them, but we have a challenge time now. And that time factor or the goal is like a, in, in our world today, it's like a Gantt chart. People love Gantt charts, but the one great thing about a Gantt chart is you could change the date and everything moves. And we just keep on moving that line saying we're going to communicate. So that's the first thing. The second is when you look at speed, 
the three of us have lived in Asia and I, I actually grabbed the URL years ago and it's called business at the speed of Asia. We all know that if you do something in Asia, if you call up Europe and you say, I need something done, they'll say, ah, end of month. And so you're like, fine, two weeks. You call up America and they say two to three weeks, which is the same. And then you give it to somebody in Asia at five o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night. And the next morning they walk in with 25 pages of a spreadsheet with everything actually calculated out. You agree? I think the three of us who lived in Asia, you know it. That's it. You're afraid to send something at seven o'clock at night because it will be done by the morning. The, the challenge in my mind with goals is we're setting goals that don't solve the challenge. They give people goals to solve. I, I've analyzed this for the past eight years. I'm not a, I still eat meat. Uh, I, I'm on a computer. I'm doing all the things that I, I do use toilet paper. We talked about that earlier. The, I think there's six. There's climate change, mass extinction, ecosystem collapse, displacement, all species, displacement, unrest, and explosive impact. For example, last year, there were 56 conflicts on this planet, more than any time in recorded history. Those six connect. They all work with one another. You can't pick something and solve it. You have to solve for them simultaneously. And then you have to be counterintuitive on how you do that. So just saying we're going to do wind, well, we've already heard all the challenges with wind killing species and the, the challenges with large birds. And when we say, well, we want to do, we need to have everybody uh, get on board with all of these. Well, they don't understand them. People don't understand what these mean. So I think that the challenge with goals is they're not clear and there is no universal plan that people could jump onto. There are goals and that changes that we're not gonna be a reductive species. We are not reductive. You're not going to stop using. We all have lights on. I have two 34-inch monitors here, plus another computer. <laughs> I'm using more energy than the average person would have used 20 years ago on this call. Could we make more? Sure. But it's still 50 to 60 degrees on the ground in India with 1.4, 1.2 billion people. And the mountain claps are, are all evaporate or um, create water spills. Uh, sea level water rise in Hong Kong, we had a T10 and a super typhoon in one year, the first in recorded history. And that was about five years ago, I think, four years ago. So we're we're not solving with our goals. And the goals, if they're good, help get people to a destination. We just don't have them yet. I'm, I'm going to say something very unusual for a private equity guy now which is and when it comes to climate change and sea level rise uh, everyone keeps talking about miami which i live close to i'm actually not worried about miami i'm worried about bangladesh in the near term and, and as you say indonesia and the unusual thing to say is what we need more of to solve these problems is empathy and understanding of both fellow human beings in other parts of the world and understanding of other species and Sadly, we see too little of that. In fact, that's gone into reverse, particularly in the last half year. And we don't have it. I yeah. That's one of the challenges I had coming back to the United States. There was just a shooting where a Chinese person shot up a church because he doesn't like Taiwanese people. I mean, we, what is wrong? There, it's, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to crawl under a rock some of these days. Yeah, on the um, issue of sea level rising in, in, in here in, in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City, the Mekong Delta, if it goes up, you know, one meter, which it's, you know, forecast to do, then it takes away um, the land that's used by 20 something million people. They'll all have to move and find new places. And Red River Delta in the north is more or less the same story. So that may be part of the reason they're so earnest on getting their own renewable energy program going. And I, I do think that it, it, it's a good example of how these things can work in reason, reasonably fast time frames. So um, Vietnam introduced uh, solar energy six years ago. I was one of the pioneers who did a rooftop solar project with my house. 
And, after, you know, that was six years ago. And now there's 16,000 some odd um, household and industrial rooftop solar um, accounting for 24% of the national installed electricity capacity, just in five years from nothing to you know 24% of national installed capacity. And a lot of that, I mean, I really credit the the private sector for doing it. They saw the opportunity, the, the panel rates came way down um, and the installation was easy. Had all these Vietnamese guys running around who know knew how to do the old solar water heater panels, and they could transfer that that know how to doing the the, the PVs. So it was a um, terrific set of circumstances, but a great success. So now they're trying to replicate that with wind, and we're trying to introduce uh, geothermal at this point. <laughs> Maybe this is a good data point that I learned. We're afraid of a meter rise. But are you afraid of a 15 cm rise, six inches? Are you afraid of that? You look in the ocean, you can't even see it. The challenge with 15 cm is that uh, tidal surges, when there are typhoons and hurricanes, go up between one to three meters, and 40% of the world population lives in coastal regions. That's why I brought up Indonesia. 17,500 islands. It's not that the water's gonna make a difference. You can't go out to the ocean and say, oh, it's up three CM. But the challenge is Maldives will be gone. The challenge is the New York City subway has 870 or 780, I forget the number of pumps. And if it gets destroyed multiple times in a short period of time, they can't afford to rebuild it. And I have, I happen to live on the top of a hill but there's some reason an aqueduct under us. And whenever there's a power outage, we have a sump pump and it fills up the basement. So even though it's just about that much, if you let yep. it sit there, the house is no longer livable. Yep. So we are, again, it goes, Vietnam's doing a great job in that one area. But there are a lot of people who really don't care about any of this. A lot of people or their yep. actions don't dictate that. So I'm, I, I like to be out, we're working on something. We work every day, every, very hard on it. It's just that I get frustrated because I'm looking for other plans and they're, they're micro plans. They don't, they don't bring the whole picture together. Oh, I think that's really important. I, I think that's one of the biggest problems with our species is that we've become so compartmentalized and it comes, comes down to our very education which is another bee in my bonnet that mm. um, there's the, the, the famous adage now that we know more and more about less and less. And um, I'm, um, I'm talking to educators about this at, at the moment. Um, one of my friends um, uh, is starting a new institute, a transdisciplinary institute at UCL, and I might be um, helping those folks out, but um, um, it, 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 you said it quite eloquently earlier, um, David, and uh, actually Jonathan Porritt, um, a futurist in the UK, said he, he always got frustrated with his green friends in the UK. Um, this was a, a guy that was involved in the Green Party in the UK years and years ago, and he used to get frustrated with his um, uh, environmentalist friends because they um, didn't take into account the um, level of poverty and social justice issues and the people involved in social justice would not be taken in to account the collapse of our um the uh, of our biosphere um i i do think that um we are starting to look wider and wider um that's been my experience over the years i, I used to feel that um if you were a generalist or, or a um, a, a lateral thinker uh, in most organizations um, in, in some ways you were discriminated against when I started my career. Now I, I see a lot more roles for, for, for people like us. Um, but um, how, how does the um, panel um, think, I mean, okay, th there's some agreement here that these goals are a, a little bit difficult to even set in the f in the first place but um assuming we need some purpose some goals some desired outcomes how do we police them or better better police them 
Um, is it, um, do we need to empower governments more? It seems that we've already made the transition that the world's le being led by the private sector in many cases. Um, um, do, do we need to empower governments more? Do, um, do we need more activists involved? Um, I was talking to Chip Commons earlier and said that you have activist investors sitting on boards of, of even oil and gas companies. I mean, what? How, how do we police police them? Uh, um, would you like to start, Michael? Yeah, I, I, I probably now will say something quite uh, usual for a private equity guy, which is I, I love the concept of core competencies and. And I think various stakeholders uh, in society and, and in civilization have various core competencies. And so if I, if I say by definition, an activist uh, has the competency of agitating, formulating a vision, focus on a single-minded purpose and, and holding others to account with regards to that vision and, and, uh, and formulate a purpose. Public sector to me is the legitimate aggregator of society's uh, multiple opinions and finding the consensus and uh, operating the complex systems that come from it. And we can start debating healthcare for a second, but broadly speaking, that's what the private sector, the, the public sector does well. And the private sector is good at finding profit opportunities, creating efficiencies in those complex systems. And, and I'm sure I've forgotten a few other stakeholders, but I think if we focus each of them on what they're good at and then making sure the interfaces and the boundaries are well defined and work well. And so obviously the, prop the private sector doesn't try to arbitrage the public sector, but operates within the framework. And that's where the policing comes in. Um, we're off to a good start. I think it gets confused when companies try to run governments uh, or when activists try to run the private sector. Um, that, that would be my two cents. How about you, Fred? Um, I mean, there's not a one size fits all answer, but um, I do think the role of the consumer is, is, is important. Um, you know, and I mentioned the Vietnam's development of its solar energy um, industry and how much of a success that's been. Um, a lot, another driving factor in it was the consumers buying the Nike tennis shoes and the Adidas shoes and the sportswear and the um, you know the, the furniture and everything. And the, the fact that the value chain should be should be green um, and that the consumers, um, are, you know, that the manufacturers and the brands are sensitive enough to the anticipation of the consumer desire that, that that's where they see the trends going that the consumers don't want to wreck the planet with a pair of tennis shoes they want to you know wear their tennis shoes w w you know without feeling guilty um so that that's a factor and they honestly you know we talk to them about their plans why they're doing this and they you know we talked about the gut with the government and it's echoing back there too so it's a real it's a real factor and that's 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 a good thing thank you thanks um well, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, D David, would you like to have the um, second sure. to last word? Just real, cool, real quickly. Uh, all of us on the phone remember, I'm assuming based upon the way we all look, that we remember wearing out a pair of shoes. Actually okay. wearing out a pair of shoes. No one wears out shoes today in, in developed nations. They don't wear them out. They have more shoes than they'll ever be able to wear out if they wear them every day for the rest of their lives, as well as shirts and as well as everything else. So... Uh, I don't know if policing will work because we resist policing. However, if we make solutions that are better and people love change, I hate the saying people don't love change. People love change. New baby, birth of a brand new car, getting a raise, getting a promotion, uh, traveling on holiday. They love that. What they don't love is change that is negative and unexpected. You'll take positive and unexpected winning the lottery, but you don't like negative and unexpected. And I think leadership, especially governments or governance that we have today, often delivers negative or negative and unexpected returns, too long, too expensive. They don't know how to think of the interconnectedness. And I say, I would say that if you put the door in the right place and it makes life easier, they will all walk through that door. There'll be some who complain, but you'll still walk through the door. So the question here is, are we going to make the right door? that they'll all want to go through. And that's, that's my everyday. 
Thank you. Well, uh, the panel's coming to a close. I um, I believe that uh, we are facing existential threats um, uh, to the future of our species. Um, uh, can, can I help? Can I can I add to? Can we change that sentence? We always say the future of our species. <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> but you, you can you can offer your own. Uh, you can offer your own, David. Offer a suggestion for all species on Earth. We always say our species, and I think we should say all species on Earth to redirect the conversation. There are uh, like 11, 12,000 of amphibians on this planet. Half of them are close to getting on the endangered species list. There are 400 shark species. I think uh, there's 100 or some odd on the endangered species list. Uh, if we don't have them, what happens to our planet? Sure, we'll live. I mean, the humans will go on. But we have to start turning it into for all species on Earth. And that's, well, that's a different dialogue. Yeah. Saving the human species is Elon Musk. What about the whales, dolphins, and amoebas? And there's only going to be a million people on Mars. That leaves 10 billion people on Earth. What about them? See, it's all species. And we need them all. We need an ecosystem. Oh, yes. I, I mean, in terms of our, my own personal mission, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I believe we need to build an ecological or what I call a Gaian civilization. And I use the word Gaia to emphasize the web of life uh, and that we can't continue living as though nature is like a a refrigerator that we can just dip into when as and when we need something the the, the reason why i emphasize the existential threat to our species um, is because so many people are self selfish and self-centered i like to remind us that that it's not just about <laughs> saving the whale it absolutely is but um the the um uh, we could really see a situation, as many scientists, including Stephen Hawking, have warned, where we eliminate ourselves. Uh, and and um, uh, planet Earth might continue. Um, life might not be completely extinguished. Um, there's entirely a, a good case to be made that we could wipe ourselves out. It's um, dinosaurs. It's we, we've, yeah. this planet. We're a blip on the whole scale of human of this planet. We're nothing. Oh, yeah. I mean, what? Arguably, as much as four million years, as little as a couple of hundred thousand versus four point five um, billion years. Um, but no, I, 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 I agree. I agree with you. I mean, we, we need to look at the whole web of life. Um, it's just, anyway, it's just a phrase and I hear it all the time and I want to say, come on, let's change it. It's stronger if you say we're impacting all living species. So when I see India, I see there's, a, I think, a tiger that only exists in India. What happens when that tiger is gone? It's an extinction of a species. What does 50 to 60 degrees Celsius mean? It means mass extinction. It means ecosystems completely collapsing. It means displacement of people and species. It means unrest because they're all fighting like people are fighting for Ukraine moving into Europe. Now there's a lot more people in Europe than there were before. They will be fighting because there's more people on the same land mass. And then we have explosive impact, uh, the overfishing of our seas. So if we change the dialogue to say all species, maybe people will hear that. Oh, no, I, I concur in terms of mission and desired outcome. Um, well, we've gone over, um, but... Um, Probably not a surprise, given that we got cut off a few times. We um, didn't. We didn't. You know. Oh, okay. but those with superior Dude, connection. Hey, Michael and I had a conversation. We actually, I went and got some wine. He and I were <laughs> having a glass of wine together. I don't know. You just kept on taking off on us like you didn't care. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, um, I've got to stop streaming the session, but um, we'd love to keep in touch with, uh, with all of you and... Um, let let us speak soon. You bet. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Oh, thank very you, much. Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you. Good talking to you.